<laughs> well, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, I am the man in England. Uh, I, I think you're probably thinking only the Brits could come up with such a title as this, the National Clinical Director for the Frail Elderly Integration. It's preposterous. Uh, it's also quite meaningless, I have to say, um, in as much as I have no authority whatsoever. Uh, and if only there were people that would listen to me and I could direct, there aren't any, sadly. Um, so I, I'm, I call myself a nudger. I gently try and nudge people in a certain direction. And I want to share some of my nudging with you this morning. Ooh. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> Maybe I can have a present, unless I'm pressing the wrong button, I don't know. There's, there's a limited option of buttons to press here. Well, maybe something's happening. Oh, here we go. Okay. Right. Um, so, uh, yes, I was appointed uh, back in uh, uh, April. I've been at it now for about two and a half years. And I thought I'd give you a bit of a visual representation of what it's felt like over the last two and a half years. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 and I'm sorry about the language. We understand. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but it really is a, a job that requires you to, to hang on to your fingernails. Uh, and I think everybody here would share that sensation because this is really difficult work. This is the most challenging thing I've ever had to, to do. Uh, and this is the most challenging thing that all of us here has to do uh, to improve our health care and social care for the most frailest and vulnerable people in our societies. So this is our plan on a page, if you like. This is how we're conceptualizing what it is we're trying to achieve. Uh, this is where I have worked uh, all my professional life as a, a geriatrician, uh, basically hauling people in trouble out of a river, uh, rescuing them in the hospital, trying to get them well again. Uh, and yet every now and then, there's been a little moment when I've been able to peer up the river, upstream, and see the broken bridge the endless numbers of older people are just falling, toppling into this river. Uh, and so the, the simple concept that we're trying to embody in the work we're doing uh, is just very simply trying to have a much more community joined up approach to our older seniors. Uh, with much more emphasis on prevention and proactive care. Uh, and we're also, as you can see, trying to change the language somewhat, which I wanted to try and talk to you a little bit about this morning from this label, the frail elderly, which sadly is in my job title, to a different approach, an older person living with frailty. This is the language of long-term conditions, and we believe opens out a different way of conceptualizing frailty that's more meaningful for the older people themselves, but offers a different lexicon of responses. Things like genuine prevention, things like supported self-management, and things like proactive care uh, systems. So this is our plan on a page. We're a long way from achieving this at the moment. Um, and these are the things which I was just going to, to uh, talk a little bit to discuss with you um, uh, this morning. Um, I have to say that if you come to me afterwards and say, we'd love to see your national strategy uh, on older people living with frail frailty, I have to say, well, that's disappointing because we haven't got one. Uh, and the reason is, that we're not too sure exactly how and what and why we should be doing all this. We, we haven't got a preconceived idea. In a sense, we're going through a number of little limited experiments trying to learn the best way forward to change completely the way that we look after our frail older people. So this is a nationally led type approach, but it's very much locally owned and locally implemented. Um, so firstly, just thinking about uh, uh, the narrative. Um, I think the best starting point with the narrative is older people themselves, and that's why it was really great yesterday to, to share the, the uh, uh, giving voice to um, uh, uh, frail elderly Canadians. We've done similar work. The work for us has been done by uh, a group um, called uh, National Voices, National Voices is an alliance organisation that represent all the medical charities uh, in the UK, England and other countries. 
Uh, and each medical charity tends to talk with quite a muted voice, quite a silent sort of voice. But when you bring them all together in this new alliance, uh, they're very compelling, uh, and they've provided the foundation work for all the reorganisation that's going on in the English Health Service. And this was the work that they did for older people. Um, it's only about six pages long, this document, so I would recommend it to you to have a read. It's cunningly entitled, uh, I'm Still Me, uh, which it, it, it gets to the heart of the issue that older people are not an alien species. They're actually ourselves, but just grown a little bit older, or an older person who is themselves in their younger version. In other words, they're very similar. Uh, and you can see that by their, their aspirations. These are the four big things which came out of this work, the four aspirations that older people uh, aspire to. Community interactions, care and support, decision making, and this big thing about independence. Uh, and it's framed here in what's called I statements, which we have found quite powerful in changing people's hearts and minds. So this is our, our bedrock. This is where we're, we're starting from. Sadly, this is where we are at the moment in the English Health Service. Uh, we know how to treat people. It's with guideline-based medicine. And the more of it, the better. Uh, and this uh, is a very interesting article on in Age and Aging. Uh, a, a typical lady that's got five uh, long-term conditions. Now, if she's got one long-term condition, we will put a corset around her, which is highly protocolized, evidence-based medicine. If she's got two long-term conditions, we'll put two corsets around her. And when she's got five long-term conditions, well, you know what I'm going to say. She's going to have five corsets around her. Uh, and this is the medical uh, representation of that old surgical aphorism that, that the, the operation went incredibly well and was successful, but the patient died. In this analogy, we put five straitjackets around people uh, and we don't notice that they're not breathing any longer. But this is what we're really good at doing in the English Health Service. But this is what we've been uh, arranging our health care system to deliver over the last two decades. So here's an interesting little thought. Why don't we focus on the person rather than, <coughs> rather than the disease? Very simple thought, but quite powerful in terms of changing people's uh, 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 conceptualization of things. Um, and this is where frailty can come into the magic key to unlock this problem. Because, of course, frailty is not a disease. It's a healthcare state, but it involves the whole person. So we've seen frailty as a magic method to try and recalibrate the health service to help deal with multimorbidity. Um, and this is the narrative that we've been uh, articulating in the English Health Service, um, frailty as a long-term condition. Now, already some people in this audience will be getting a bit anxious now because you'll be thinking, it's not a long-term condition. It's not, it's not. Well, that's why there's a question mark there, okay? Because this is just a way of just trying to reconceptualize frailty in a way that might be meaningful in terms of redesigning systems of care. So we could, whoops, we could, for example, think about frailty being a pro progressive state rather than the way we, we manage frailty in the English Health Service at the moment, which is very much a crisis response mode. We allow people to present in crisis rather than thinking, well, they, they didn't develop, their, their, their frailty didn't spring up overnight. Uh, it developed over uh, uh, 10 to 15, uh, 5 to 15 years. And there may be some preventable components, which I'll come back to in, in a moment or two. So this is a part of the narrative that we've been trying to introduce to change people's understanding of frailty. So developing the frailty narrative. These are some of the publications which I know from talking to people yesterday you're very familiar with. Fit for Frailty, produced by the British Geriatric Society. Uh, we were very pleased from the point of view of NHS England when this was produced, because this was quite a big uh, uh, venture for British Geriatric Society to move from their very hospital-based orientation to a much more community-inspired orientation. We've also uh, produced a, a very simple evidence guide, which I brought some copies of, which is just four pages 
which is a review of reviews which commissioners have found very useful to understand the sorts of interventions they should be putting into place. Um, this is another uh, thing that we've done that's been very uh, well received. It's a very simple uh, uh, guide to frailty that we've distributed free to 65,000 practice nurses in primary care. Um, so that again, they can begin to understand this new narrative of frailty. And again, I've got an example of that with me today to, to if people would like to have a look at it. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk a little bit later on around our guide to healthy ageing, uh, where we're, we're appealing directly to older people themselves. So, if we believe that frailty might be better conceptualised as a long-term condition, uh, it's going to be quite important for us to identify frailty in routine care. So this has been one of the big areas of work that we've developed. And this audience will well know that we've got some really good methods of identifying frailty, not least um, the comprehensive geriatric assessment approach, which not only identifies frailty, of course, but also magically gives you some of the, the right necessary responses to that individual that might improve their health and their outcomes. But we've also got a range of simple assessments that uh, we've had for a long time but have not been routinely used in the English Health Service. Uh, and I have to say, God bless the Canadians. Uh, uh, we've got the Edmonton Frail Scale, which is now being used quite a lot actually in surgical uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, and we've got what we call the Rockwood 7, uh, because uh, we didn't realise that it was called the Clinical Frailty Scale. Well, we did, but we'd, I don't think we wanted to pay the, uh, the, the, the fees associated with it. Uh, I, I, I'm jesting. I mean, we just call it the Rockwood 7. Uh, and it's being used um, really fairly intensively now around England. So thank you very much, Ken. But the thing that we wondered about was uh, all these things uh, uh, here uh, require new work from healthcare professionals. Uh, and when you're talking to healthcare professionals, they're incredibly busy. And you say to them, I know you're so busy, but there's just one more thing we'd like you to do. Um, that's, you know, that's the sort of rebuttal that you get from them. So we, we thought, well, wouldn't it be a better idea if we could see if we could utilise routine data um, to identify people's uh, frailty status? Uh, and so with, with huge um, gratitude to Ken and his colleagues from Halifax, Nova Scotia, we've been developing an ele electronic frailty index tool suitable for use in the English Health Service. Uh, and uh, uh, um, it, we've been reasonably successful in this. Uh, Ken this morning has outlined the principles behind the frailty index, that it's based on the cumulative deficit model of frailty, which I've always found very appealing. The strategic advantage we have in the English Health Service is that 98% of our population have an electronic health care record in primary care. The strategic weakness we have in the English Health Care Service is that electronic health care system in primary care is not shared in secondary care or community care. And that's something that obviously has got to be attended to. But the big advantage is that every 98% of the population does have an electronic health care record. The nuggets of information that are collected in there are coded using read codes, which I think are peculiar to the English Health Service, but they map onto the clinical terms version 3 and SNOMED. So it's, they're similar, it's a similar language. Uh, and uh, essentially we constructed an, uh, a frailty index using these little nuggets of information, these little read codes. Uh, and we tested it in a very large data set of, of maybe 10 million uh, uh, population uh, electronic healthcare record uh, uh, data set. We, we selected just half a million people uh, and that seemed to work well. We had an internal validation process uh, and then we did an external validation process uh, press the right button um, which was done in an entirely different data set using a different uh, electronic healthcare uh, system and with different GPs, different geography in England and it worked uh, just as well in that. Uh, in terms of predicting need for hospital care, long-term care and mortality. And for those people who are interested, the C statistic here is about 0 0.71, so reasonable uh, uh, calibration. And I should say that although I'm describing this very briefly this morning, I'd love to have credit for it, but actually the credit goes to one of my clinical senior lecturers, Andrew Clegg, who's done all this work over the last 18 months or so. But what we've done in NHS England 
is that we've been having conversations with clinical commissioning groups, CCGs, to see how they might make best use of such a tool. Uh, and this is the roadmap, if you like, the spread map uh, as it exists at the moment. Uh, and you can see that uh, we have about 35 clinical commissioning groups that are now using this tool. That may not seem a lot, but we've only been doing this for less than a year. Uh, and secondly, this tool is only in one of the electronic healthcare systems at the moment. It will very soon be spreading into a second system, and that will give us greater spread. Uh, but you can see the sorts of uses to which the tool is being put. Uh, defining at-risk populations, uh, deprescribing, uh, end-of-life care, advanced uh, care planning, and supported self-management. Uh, and it's been fascinating to see that the, the way the tool has been used, that we're not prescribing it, that there's lots of innovation going on uh, to see how this tool can best be used in local places. Uh, this is our distribution of the electronic frailty index uh, and as uh, Ken was saying um, it peters out at 0 0.7 uh, and you can see the gamma distribution uh, and we've just chunked it up in quartiles so we have 7% who have got severe frailty, 20% with moderate frailty, 42% with mild and then we've got a group of fit older people. And we thought, well, um, is there anything we could do with this group of people, a large group of people who've, who've got mild frailty? Um, in our terms, a group of older people who are beginning the slowing up process. They wouldn't be overtly frail, but they would be beginning to slow up, slow down. Um, and this is where the prevention agenda comes in. And yes, it's true that we don't know a lot about how to prevent frailty, but we've known for a long time now um, uh, since 1999 uh, about these risk factors which powerfully predict somebody at roughly the age of 70 losing their independence at roughly the age of 80. But in the English Health Service we've done really very little about trying to moderate these risk factors, certainly not in, in any systematic way. So we know for example that in England uh, an older person with a hearing problem will on average wait 10 years before they get a hearing aid. In that time, the loss of hearing is a risk factor for them developing dementia. Uh, they also lose some of the dexterity of being able to use the hearing aid. They also lose some of the cognitive skills in adjusting to life with the hearing aid. So this isn't good use of, of prevention technology. So we've packed, and we also had an, uh, several engagement events with older people themselves, uh, and these were some of the other topics that they felt were very important to pr promotion of their well-being in later life. So we packaged all this up into a very simple, easy to use guide that, that's called the Practical Guide to Healthy Aging. It was done in collaboration with Age UK. Uh, and it's, uh, we didn't, we gave it a very soft launch because we wanted to, to, to look at this cautiously, but it proved to be incredibly popular. It costs less than 20 English pennies for one of these very simple guides. I should say it's written with a health literacy age of about 11, so it, but it, 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 it's, it's very easy to get into, in other words. And it's more, more of a signposting type approach than a very detailed uh, account of, of all these various risk factors. Um, you may know that later this week is International Older People's Day, the 1st of uh, October. I'm sure there's some events being planned. Uh, one of the things that we'll be announcing back home uh, is a new tr strategic partnership between the NHS and our fire services, which you might think is a slightly strange sort of an alliance. Uh, but it turns out that we have very few domestic fires in England now because of so much, uh, the, the equipment is so much safer these days and lots of fire alarms, etc. So we have a group of able-bodied men, firemen, um, and we have housebound older people, and we think we'd like to put the two together. So we've been working with them, uh, and the, the fire brigade are going to be doing over the next 12 months uh, six, 670,000 home visits, uh, and we're hoping that this will be part of the package that they'll be delivering. So that's um, the routine identification of frailty. This is a simple thing, but this took us over eight months to try and negotiate, and it may be that the Canadian Health Service has got this already, but we had no frailty codes in use, either in secondary care or primary care. 
So it was a bit pointless identifying people who are living with frailty and then not being able to code them in any way. So we've introduced three new codes uh, and we'll be auditing those, which is a very simple thing for us to do electronically. But more importantly, we'll be distributing this information around the system because we have something called a summary care record, which is at the moment it's very vestigial. It just covers drugs and allergy status. But we've been working on an enhanced summary care record uh, the importance of this is that any software supplier in the English Health Service has to, to build in interoperability for the summary healthcare record so that this little file can pass around all the different IT systems. So our, our plan is that the frailty status and other things like advanced care plans uh, will be incorporated in the summary care record and we'll be disseminating knowledge around the healthcare system of older people who are more at risk. And we're hoping that might lead to better quality clinical decision making. Certainly decision making that's less based on the person's age and is more based on their physiological and healthcare status, their health status. Um, so incentivizing primary care. Clearly if we're going to be developing a primary community, community care based model uh, for frailty, we need to find a way of getting our general practitioners and our nurse practitioners and our advanced nurse practitioners on board with this. Uh, and money does seem to work. Uh, sadly, I'd like to say that we could just do this in a professional way and just uh, appeal to people to, to do more work. But uh, actually, you do have to dangle a carrot. And so the carrot that, that we've been dangling, it's called an enhanced service payment. Uh, and uh, they've been asked to identify, GP's been asked to identify the top 2% most vulnerable people on their practice and to offer them um, a range of different uh, health uh, interventions. In practice, because it's the 2% most at risk, they've mostly been having advanced care plans. Uh, but clearly, if you can link together routine identification of frailty, i.e. the electronic frailty index, with incentivising primary care, it's possible in the future, and this is a future thing, that we'll increase the 2% to maybe a 7 or 10%, so they can begin to start putting into place a lot more multidisciplinary team assessment uh, and care and support planning. So it's a little bit for the future. And, and finally, just to, to finish off a little bit on outcomes-based commissioning, uh, because this may be something that we could actually uh, partnership. Um, the story is that there's a hole in the boat, but nobody wants the damn hole. <laughs> the problem is, uh, older people in particular require lots of different uh, provider care uh, uh, inputs. So if you're thinking about a care pathway for an older person with frailty, in England they might need up to 17 or 20 different health, care health and social care providers. Trying to bring all this together uh, is the world of integration uh, and this is one of the things that we're really working hard on now in the English healthcare service and one of the ways of trying to do this one of the ways of trying to nudge people in the direction of integrating their services is to think about a common outcomes language uh, and hitherto that's been quite difficult for us to achieve so we've asked um, a, a group called the International Convention on Health Outcomes Measurement I Chung for short uh, to help try and remedy this for us. Uh, and they are an institute that works out of uh, Boston, uh, the Harvard uh, in Business School in Boston, and also the Karolinski Institute in, in Sweden. Uh, and they've got a tried and tested method of developing health outcome suites. So they've got a, 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 a back repertoire of a number of conditions that they've done this for. So we're, we're working with them now. We're sponsoring them to do an international piece of work to develop an outcome suite for older people's services. Uh, and um, you can see that um, Canada is represented by Samir Sinha. I don't, I don't think he's here today. I've only met him by telephone conference calls. Uh, and this work has just started now. Uh, it's due to produce the outcome suite by about January of next year. It would be great to partner with you in this uh, and see if the outcome suite would be suitable not just for the English Health Service but for the Canadian Health Service too. Um, so it's uh, trying to develop this magic shared language that would allow different providers to come together. 
We're doing a lot of innovative work at the moment in England trying to promote this integration agenda. Things like um, new, completely new reconfigurations where a hospital that's in a large city with a, a large inner city deprived area where the quality of general practice is quite poor and difficult to recruit GPs, that hospital may now be incentivised to actually employ GPs uh, and under that, that organisation will be responsible for that list in the, in the city. In other areas, there are GPs which are coming together in very large organisations with populations of 100,000 and their income then becomes so large that they can Im afford to employ consultants. So they're employing geriatricians, gynaecologists, psychiatrists, uh, and that's changing the shape, or it's hoped that it'll change the shape of this secondary primary care split that we've had in our health service for a long time. Things will blur together a lot more. So we need this common language to, for, for this to occur. So um, back to the beginning, and as T.S. Eliot says in his very uh, well-known poem, The Four Quartets, um, you arrive at the place where you started and maybe you know it for the first time. Uh, I hope you can see, I hope I've convinced you that the journey we're taking uh, is, is a complicated one, but one that I think we can define, uh, maybe in the language of frailty being a long-term condition, but certainly thinking a lot more about, rather than crisis uh, systems of care, prevention and proactive care and supported self-management, there's a lot we need to learn about how to do this. It would be great to share all that with you uh, jointly. Um, uh, and this whole idea around trying to shift the, uh, the proportion of people who are cared for in hospital and have much more of a community-inspired approach. So thank you very much.